So welcome everyone to the uh, last session of the day. Uh, firstly, thank you for choosing to put off your stomachs and attend last talk. I know that it overlaps the um, start of the scheduled dinner. Uh, so what am I talking about today? So and I will try and limit the rambling so we can all get to food as quickly as possible. So what am I talking about? So Zephyr LP WAN. Um, what are your options in upstream Zephyr? And when should you be looking to choose the various technologies? Um, who am I? Um, I'm Jordan Yates. Um, I have over seven, well, I have about seven years' experience in ultra low power wireless sensor networks. Um, I've been contributing to Zephyr for the last sort of four years, and I'm currently the maintainer of the uh, LoRaWAN and the SeamSys neural network subsystems. Um, I'm also a co-founder at Ambient. Um, we focus on ultra low power wireless devices and getting algorithms running on these sort on these classes of devices. So LP WAN. What does it actually mean? So LP WAN as a concept sort of encompasses a few different um, aspects. Um, not all of them necessarily apply strictly to every technology, but a majority of them will. So the first thing is basically LP WAN networks typically have small data volumes. You're normally going to be talking about bytes or kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes. Um, going along with the small data volumes, you've also probably got low data bit rates or lower data bit rates. Um, kilobits per second is typical, although some interfaces do support megabits. Um, and even if the interfaces are high, um, high bit rate, the actual data throughput might be low bit rate because of duty cycle limitations or whatever. Um, that leads into sort of low radio utilization. So LP WAN is typically only transmitting or receiving for a short period of time. Um, and that's typically to reduce power consumption and also sometimes for, reg sometimes for regulatory reasons. And probably the, the headline feature of LP WAN is that it's typically designed to be long range. So um, I'll ballpark it at over 100 meters of range. Um, but yeah, it's you're not talking about going from here to the other side of the room. You're talking about going from here to the other side of, um, I don't know, the campus or the city or whatever. And this long range sort of implies that you have a large link budget on your radio. But as I'm sure many of you are aware, in physics, there's no free lunch. Um, there's always consequences to the choices you make. And so you can't optimize for a system that is has ranges of thousands of kilometers and gigabits a second of data throughput and doesn't consume any power, right? Like you are choosing one thing or another. Um, some of the more obvious ones are that if your interfaces have higher data rates, they typically have lower set, um, they are less sensitive to RX. I don't know if lower RX sensitivity passes there, but um, if they're less sensitive, then you typically have shorter range. So higher data rate typically results in shorter ranges. If you want to compensate for that, you can sort of you can increase the transmit power of your radios. That gives you longer ranges, but it also means you're just physically using more energy. So you're going to have shorter battery lives. Um, in some cases, you can use more complex modulation schemes to send more data over the same um, sort of frequency um, bandwidth. Um, and that can give you higher data rates, but that also tends to lead to higher module costs, although that can be offset in scale to some extent. Um, and if you want to send like more data through, that's larger packets, but if your data rate stays the same, that just means you're spending more time actually transmitting, which again can lead to shorter battery lives. So, depending on your application, you really want to be sort of choosing the right sweet spot where the trade-offs that you're making make sense. And this is why there's a range of LP WAN wireless technologies in general, right? Like there's not just the one true wireless standard. So typically I think many people, you don't go into a problem and go, I need to use LoRa WAN to solve this problem, right? The, you start with a problem, then you work through your requirements to work out what technologies are going to make sense to solve this problem. And I guess the, well, the, 
the three sort of um, questions that I normally ask at the start of a project is, in the context of LP WAN, is okay. Well, firstly, where is this device going to operate? Right. If it's operating in an urban environment, well, then maybe you can rely on um, cell coverage. If it's operating in a remote area, like, say, the middle of Australia, which is where I'm from, cell coverage, mm, you don't have much hope there. Um, so you might have to rely on something more um, esoteric, like the satellite. Um, but if it's just operating in the home context, well, then pure Wi-Fi might make perfect sense. The second question is, like, what sort of data is the device sending? Is it trying to send a audio stream? Is it trying to send, um, so audio stream might be continuous, but not too high data rate. Um, if you're sending images, it might be a lot of data, but sort of bursty. Um, or maybe you're just sampling a temperature sensor every 10 minutes and sending that. Like it's, it could be very different orders of magnitude and how much data you actually need to send. And the third one is how is this device gonna be powered? If, it's, if you can plug it into the wall, well then you're, essentially have infinite energy and you can make decisions based on that. But if it's a primary cell battery, like a coin cell, well, that's gonna limit your choices um, or you're gonna be replacing batteries every two days. Um, it may be, if it's solar rechargeable, you might be able to support um, higher energy things, but you're probably not gonna be able to support like a permanent LTE connection or a permanent satellite uplink, depending on the size of your solar panels, obviously. So um, native, Zephyr, native Zephyr LP WAN, what are your options? So as far as I can tell, um, based on my experience and my brief perusal last week when I was writing these slides, um, <laughs> you've essentially got four choices for uh, native wireless inside of Zephyr. So the first of these is IP networking. There's been a couple of talks today um, about that. Um, the exact parameters and trade-offs you're making there um, are very specific to what sort of IP networking you're using. Um, in Zephyr, this typically means it's a LTE link or a Wi-Fi link. Um, Ethernet obviously doesn't count as a wireless network. Um, secondly, you've got Bluetooth low energy. Um, now, Bluetooth, you may be thinking, is um, particularly short range, and that is true, it is shorter range than some other options, but um, especially with Bluetooth 5 and the additional Fi options, you can trade off um, increased range for reduced data rates. Uh, third up, you've got LoRa, which is the physical layer, and LoRa WAN, which is a, a networking layer on top of that. Um, this is probably the most uh, true LP WAN um, system. Um, it sort of ticks all of those boxes of it is very long range, it is low data rate, it is low duty cycle, it is whatever. Um, but as a consequence of all of that, the physical data you can send over these links is quite small. Um, and especially because it operates mainly in the um, unregulated ISM bands, or not unregulated, because it operates in the ISM bands, um, some regions have quite strict limitations on um, data, um, data rates. So I think, I forget which region it is, but it's, there's a 0.1 duty cycle limit on um, the radio usage, so that's 0.1% of the time you're allowed to be transmitting. Um, and the fourth option, which I um, have the least experience with, um, is IEEE 802.15.4. Um, it's another 2.4 gigahertz um, networking physical layer. Um, typically, you don't use it directly. You use it um, as the back end for another networking system, be that open thread or matter, which uses an open thread um, or something like Zigbee. Um, but there's thread implementations in Tree. I don't believe there's anything Zigbee, although I think I saw an NXP Zigbee reference somewhere. So at a high level, why would you sort of choose one of these four options? Um, IP networking is probably obvious to a lot of people. Um, if you want your devices to talk directly to the cloud, if you want easy integration with the whole host of um, IP networking sort of features, be it precision time protocol, co-app, MQTT, whatever, um, obviously you probably want to be choosing IP networking. Um, and they typically tend to be the, the highest throughput options as well. So if you are talking about um, like 
video or audio streaming, you are probably talking about an IP network. Um, Bluetooth Low Energy um, is really great for smartphone interaction. It's basically the only option, although there's an asterisk there. Um, it's really good at low power data broadcast. So if you want to be able to send information from a single device and without caring whether there is one device that wants to hear that information or a thousand devices, Bluetooth advertising lets you do that in a way that's almost free from an energy perspective. Um, but it also can give you directed sort of point to point comms with device to device communications and that's through um, Bluetooth GAT, which is what you'd probably most likely be familiar with through like pairing um, headphones with your phone, for example, that's a, a Bluetooth GAT link. LoRaWAN is when you want extreme range. Um, it's great for remote deployments where there is no um, infrastructure already and you're willing to install your own infrastructure. Um, because the physical layer is very, is quite simple, um, the RF hardware itself is quite cheap. Um, so that can be a important factor for some cost, um, cost sensitive applications. Um, yeah, uh, Luca even told me yesterday that um, you can do LoRaWAN directly to satellites, which I was not aware of, which is pretty cool. And that's medium Earth orbit as well, not low Earth orbit, so even more impressive. Um, and the fourth one there is uh, yeah, the IEEE 802 um, Again, typically you're not choosing to use this, you're choosing to use one of the higher, um, higher stacks. So uh, Thread is, um, I guess, also sort of falls under IP networking because you can run uh, six low pan over it. Um, Matter, which you're probably aware of, um, lots of song and dance made about that. How much impact? I'm not sure, but if you want to use smart home, then you may end up be you may end up using um, 802.15.4 um, and things like Zigbee. And this is actually where the asterisk for the smartphone interaction comes in because I think the next iPhone actually has a inbuilt thread sort of radio support, so you do actually now have a, another option for that. So those are sort of some, some text comparisons. How do these things actually compare in terms of um, like performance? So um, for these tables, in terms of IP, I've split these out into um, three separate um, sort of individual technologies. So you've got two LTE um, based um, protocols or technologies, and you've also got Wi-Fi there as well. Um, so I talked back, back at the start about how range is related to link budget. Link budget is itself made up of two components. So you've got how much power are you transmitting with and what's the lowest signal level that you can receive with. Um, and then you just sort of add those two things together um, and you end up with the link budget. And hopefully it's sort of easy to see here why um, LoRa it has such a range advantage over the other technologies, it's purely because the link budget is so much higher. Um, and that's that's due to the physical layer choices that they've made. Um, also probably uh, the next slide is probably a little bit easier to understand the range differences, but the rule of thumb is that a 6 dB increase in your link budget basically results in a doubling of your range. But the other interesting things here is that the, um, no, that's not on this slide, but, um, Where am I going? Yeah, so um, yeah, we're going to the next one, I think. All right, so link budget and dB is, is all well and good, but decibels is obviously a logarithmic scale. So if you compare this back to a, an actual range, um, what I've done here is I've just taken the link budgets, normalized them all to Bluetooth, which is something probably most people are somewhat familiar with the range. Um, so what you can see here is that like, um, if you assume that Bluetooth is like a 20 meter range, for example, then that LoRaWAN range over there actually corresponds to like 80 kilometers. Now that might seem sort of ridiculous, um, but I have been part of projects where there have been, um, packets, e packets received 60 kilometers away from the 
neck of a feral pig. So not an ideal situation for RF propagation, but um, it's easily achievable. Um, and that also sort of explains why you can send um, to medium Earth orbit using LoRaWAN. Um, yeah, so I mean, like this, this sort of makes sense just from a, um, uh, a, a first impression sort of view as well, right? Like you've got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sort of down the bottom. Sorry, sorry Bluetooth and IEEE down the bottom. Wi-Fi is a little bit longer range potentially. And then you've got the cellular t technologies um, sort of sitting between them and LoRa. In terms of data rates, um, it's probably not surprising that as the range increases, the data rates tend to go down. That's not a strict, it's not a strict like one-to-one -one mapping or anything here, but the general trend there holds. Um, the 200 megabits a second for Wi-Fi is probably aspirational for some of the more complex um, and newer Wi-Fi things, less so LP WAN, but um, yeah, range goes up, data rate goes down. But the, the interesting part is how do you, um, when you combine the, the data rate and the transmit um, side, also, uh, so, that's, okay. so that, that's range. Um, the next part to sort of look at is uh, power comparisons. So the interesting part here is that even though some of these technologies on paper have the same sort of radiated transmit power, which is the DBM, the actual, um, the actual physical current consumption of those modems can actually still vary quite significantly. So you can see that um, even though um, like LoRa and, L and LTE can use uh, transmit the same power, the TX consumption can be quite different. And even especially on the, on the receiving side as well, because LoRa is such a uh, simpler physical layer, you can listen at a much lower power consumption. And that can be important for quite a few applications. Um, and coming down the bottom where Bluetooth and IEEE sort of sit, you can sort of see why, um, why it's so much cheaper to broadcast on these, um, on these uh, physical layers just because they are, um, yeah, so much lower power. Something interesting though is when you sort of compare the data rate of these interfaces to the transmit current that it takes to send. If you look at the two of them together, you sort of get a energy efficiency for a given data size. So even though LoRa might use less, um, might use less current than LTE to send the same packet, it's sending much less data at a time. So if you were trying to send, for example, a hundred bytes of payload, it would take less energy to send that on LTE than it would on LoRa, even though LoRa in absolute terms uses less um, instantaneous current. Um, and it's, yeah, so it's probably not surprising to see that the, yeah, again, the, the low data rate things are less efficient on a per byte level, but on the upside, you get the increased range for that. And finally, something which may be overlooked initially, um, but because these things are different radio technologies, they operate in different frequencies, you also do need to consider what sort of antennas you're using in these projects. Um, and these can cause pain, um, specifically with LTE. Um, firstly, you've got to consider whether the radio technology is multi-band or whether it's single band. Um, single band antennas are going to be much easier to design because you're only tuning for a single frequency, whereas multi-band antennas, which are mostly LTE, can be quite annoying to deal with. Um, but then you've just got also, again, sort of physics coming in and rearing its ugly head. Um, the lower the frequency you want, the longer the wavelength, but longer wavelengths require larger ground planes um, to radiate efficiently. So, or just sort of larger antennas. So the typical sort of um, half, half wavelength dipole, um, I've sort of put some example sizes there. Um, 21 centimeters is not a small, um, small length in the context of some classes of devices. If it's sitting on top of a truck, sure, whatever, no one really cares. But if it's going on, say, the ear of an animal, then 
21 centimeters, it's, it's not going to work so well. Um, so if you are super space constrained, then something like Bluetooth is potentially a, a better option if it matches with your other requirements. So in terms of um, getting into the specifics, I guess a little bit of each one. So um, again, some of this is um, repeating what I've said before, but with IP networking, your devices are typically connecting directly to cloud services. Um, there's a whole range of um, software libraries that Zephyr supports in terms of doing this. Um, security is up to the application itself. Um, obviously, there are built-in standards like TLS, DTLS that exist. They should be used if possible. If you're not using those, at the very least, use a standard crypto library. Don't try and roll your own encryption. It's a bad idea. Never do it. Um, but the other thing to sort of think about is that depending on which technology you're using, local device interaction can still require an alternative interface. Um, for example, if you're trying to get a technician to install something in the field and they want, you want to configure something, but the only um, connectivity you have is an LTE modem, well, it's, it's still possible, but you're going to have a lot of latency there. And if there's no LTE connectivity and that's the problem you're trying to solve, well, you're in, you're in, um, you're in a little bit of hurt. But this is potentially less of an issue with something like Wi-Fi where you can get on the same network. Um, IP networking does come with like sort of deployment requirements. So you've got, um, if you're using an LTE based system, you obviously need LTE cell towers there to connect to. Um, coverage is not universal. Um, and if you're in an area where coverage is not there, convincing a carrier to install coverage is probably not easy. I haven't tried. I suspect they want a lot of money. Um, but if you're operating where there's high population densities, this is less problematic. If you're using Wi-Fi, obviously you need um, a Wi-Fi access point. They don't cover huge areas. Um, I know because my hotel Wi-Fi right now is not great. Um, and each of these access points needs its own IP um, connection. It has its own needs its own power source, and these typically need, typically need to be like hardwired. Um, although you don't need IP if it's only local networking. Um, from the Zephyr interface itself, um, you do sort of have two options, although one of them is not particularly portable. So the obvious one is the BSD socket interface. That's what you should be using. Um, recently, Zephyr sort of, um, there used to be the option to use the standard POSIX BSD socket names, like just receive from, connect, socket, etc. Um, that option has been turned off by default now. Um, so you've got to sort of just add ZSOC to the start of everything. Not too hard, but something to be aware of. Um, the net context API is something that you can use in some situations, but it depends on the back end of your IP stack. So if your back end only implements the socket offload interface, well, you can't use net sockets. Um, and the reason why you might want net sockets is it actually is a bit more featureful in terms of what you can do with it. So you can get callbacks when the packet has been sent, for example, whereas with um, the BSD sockets, you sort of just um, call the function, then at some point later, it will be sent. Um, in terms of actually implementing it on a driver level, um, there's a few different options. Um, most of them fall into either offloaded sockets, which might be like AT commands, for example, or they do it natively with the um, Ethernet API. Um, and then you, some interfaces have this sort of interface management level at the same time. So for Wi-Fi, for example, um, you need to connect to a network or disconnect from a network, etc. Um, I'm not going to go into details of this because this is just an overview. And I'm running out of time, I guess. Um, LoRa and LoRaWAN. Um, so LoRa is the physical layer, but you can use it independently of LoRaWAN. So you can do broadcast communications with this. Um, again, security is up to the application, but because of the bit rate you have and the packet sizes, this can be challenging. Um, LoRaWAN is a networking level, networking layer built on top of LoRa. Um, it sort of drops the broadcast aspect, although you can do that in some aspects. Um, instead, individual devices talk to, with a gateway device. Um, 
when you connect to the network or to the gateway device, it sets up AES-128 security, so you do get some security by default. Um, there's several sort of classes of devices, so you can have either listening windows after TX, which limits your sort of downlink reachability, but um, optimizes for power consumption. You can have sort of scheduled receive windows, or you can have permanent receive, which um, obviously chews your battery a fair bit. Um, and again, local device interaction sort of requires an alternative interface because um, yeah, not many things actually have a, a LoRa modem inside them. Um, deployment requirements. Um, if you're just using LoRa device to device, you just whack your devices out in the field and they'll, they'll send and they'll hear each other. If you're using LoRaWAN, you need to install gateways. Um, there are some commercial providers which um, have public network servers, um, like the Things Network, for example. Um, but if you're operating it remotely, you'll probably need to install your own. Um, these things are kind of chunky on the power. Um, so this is just an example of a, a gateway I've deployed in the past. Um, it has some other things on the top, but it is mostly LoRaWAN. So it's, it's not something you can just sort of um, whack on top of a roof with not much consideration. Um, you do need to sort of plan these things. Um, each gateway, well, the gateway does need a network server. So this can either be one common network server in the cloud, which means that you need a IP connection at the gateway, or you can run the gateways um, with a local network server per device. But that means if your device moves between gateways, they won't hand over. They'll need to realize they've disconnected and try and reconnect again, which adds some complexity. Um, from an actual user perspective, it's relatively simple. Um, you start the LoRaWAN stack, you can register for some callbacks, you join, and then you call send with whatever your application data happens to be. Um, yeah, it's not a particularly complicated protocol. Or, yeah, not a particularly complicated um, application interface, I should say. Um, Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, there's a few different modes here. Um, there's some even that aren't uh, listed here, but the sort of the main ones are you've got Bluetooth advertising, which is one-to-many communications. Um, great for unordered networks where you don't really know beforehand what's going to be where. Um, secondly, you've got uh, periodic advertising, which is a relatively new part of the standard. Um, it's a sort of star network where you have one device in the, in the, in the middle and um, the listening devices can sync to those transmissions and also potentially respond in a trailing window. And then thirdly, you've got Bluetooth uh, connections, which is a one-to-one -one, um, thing. It's a high throughput link, um, but to set up a connection, you need to sort of piggyback off the back of a advertising packet. So you can't do connections without one of those advertising steps. Um, in terms of deployment requirements, if you're just doing Bluetooth advertising, you don't need to install anything. You just whack your device out there, and if someone's around and listens, they'll hear it. Um, if you're doing periodic advertising, the central devices probably probably need to be installed somewhere. And they probably need a wired power source, depending on what exactly it's doing. Um, I think the sort of the most visible application for these at the moment is the um, the smart uh, labels in supermarkets where. You have a, a label on each, we're replacing the paper labels, but the, the, um, the main central is going to be hardwired in somewhere. Um, and if you're just trying to use Bluetooth connections between devices, again, you don't need, don't need any infrastructure, you just need to hear the advertising packet and trigger a connection. Um, I'm not going to try and show any code for Bluetooth because there's a ridiculous number of ways to configure these things, so it's just going to confuse someone. Um, look at the Bluetooth samples in tree, they're all pretty good for um, setting up things. So these are the ones that are in tree, um, the native options. Um, I'll quickly go through some out of tree options and what's sort of coming in the future potentially. So um, DECT NR Plus is a, um, a networking thing that's um, it's an alternate option for uh, LTE. It's essentially private 5G. Um, so you can set up private networks, you can set up uh, mesh networking. Um, haven't personally used it yet, but it looks um, potentially like a replacement for LoRaWAN in some in some um, use cases. Um, you've also got Sigfox, which is a basically a competitor to LoRaWAN in some aspects. Um, it has the same 
uh, very long range characteristics, um, but sort of even more restrictive in terms of the duty cycles. So um, while, tech, while um, from a technology standpoint, you can send and receive as much as you want. From a network standpoint, they impose limitations of uh, six uplinks an hour and four downlinks a day. And then of course, you've got proprietary satellites. So if you want to use um, any of those, um, any of the satellite networks, be it Global Star or et cetera, um, Zephyr there's just an operating system, you can write your own drivers to do what you want. Um, but they typically tend to be high power consumption, um, quite expensive for the amount of data you want to send. But the advantage obviously is you don't need, don't need any infrastructure. And sort of looking to the future, um, non-terrestrial networks are sort of all the buzz. Um, so this is LTE direct to satellite. So again, it sort of gets rid of the requirement for a carrier to install um, cell towers where you're operating. Um, it does mean you need sort of line of sight to sky. So if you're trying to operate remotely, but indoors, probably not gonna work so well. And at least currently the cost is quite high, whether that comes down over, over time, who knows. Um, Bluetooth to satellites, which sounds funny given I sort of um, showed that the range of it was uh, not great. Um, but uh, the Hubble network has shown receiving Bluetooth packets from a, I, th I think it was a Nordic, um, a Nordic SOC with no modifications direct to satellite, which seems sort of crazy. We'll see how, how well it actually works in, in practice when quantities go up, but apparently it's possible. Um, you've got Wi-Fi Halo, which is essentially a 900 megahertz um, version of Wi-Fi. Um, still standard though, uh, like standards compliant. Um, it gives you better range, um, but it sort of suffers from the chicken and egg problem, which there's not many devices that have it because not many routers support it, but not many routers support it because not many devices need it. So it always seems to be perpetually coming soon. Um, and as I sort of mentioned before, um, thread on smartphones is apparently a thing now or will be very shortly. And that's me, I've managed to go over time, which is surprising. Um, any questions or are we going straight to dinner? Oh, thank you. Uh, so what do you think about the new uh, LoRaWAN software stack uh, promoted by SAMTEC instead of the old one? Um, uh, it's work. Uh, so I, ooh, um, I know the old one is terrible and I don't like it. Um, so I'm, ha I'm happy to see a, a rewritten version. Um, I know that uh, Luca from Ernas has actually got a stack and there's a pull request open from someone at SEMTEC to Zephyr. Um, we did sort of make the conscious decision not to sort of, not to try and change that before the LTS release. Um, so now that that's sort of passed, we're definitely looking at uh, transitioning to the, the officially supported or the supported stack going forward. Okay, thanks. No worries. Everyone wants to go to dinner. dinner. All right, great. Thank you guys. And ladies.